Um, hi, we're the Thrive Data Team, and we are here to talk about bridging the gap. Have you ever wanted to create a cool visualization for a CBO, but you weren't totally sure if they would find it useful or helpful? Have people ever been underwhelmed by your groundbreaking R package? <laughs> Have you ever been told, just show me the numbers, give me a graph? Has a CBO ever wanted you to give them the data, but they didn't know what kind of data would be helpful? Have you ever felt unsure how to respond to when a CBO sends you a spreadsheet and just asks you to create something? Have you all ever dealt with messy data, missing data, or no, no data from CBO? Have you ever been asked to provide outcome data for metrics an organization isn't even tracking? If you caught yourself saying yes to any of the questions above, we're here to tell you that you are not alone. So drawing on our experience providing capacity building support and technical assistance to a variety of youth serving community based organizations, that's what we call CBOs, um, and city agencies, we're the Thrive Data Team and we're here to share some characteristics of high quality working partnerships as well as emergent best practices for scoping work, designing and refining, and co-creating compelling and useful tools and products. So um, this is us. I'm Denali. I'm Jessica. I'm David. And this is the way that we present ourselves to community-based organizations that we work with. And one of the things that we did was we took out a lot of the technical and method speak and we went with a value statement, philosophy, and areas where we thought that our approach to doing data work would align with things that they were trying to do. And by putting ourselves out there in the world in this particular way, we found that we've gotten a lot more positive feedback and opportunities to connect from organizations. And so this is the first of a couple of emergent best practices that we wanna share because it's not necessarily that we are experts at this, this work doesn't come with the playbook, but over time we've made some good constructive mistakes and we wanna share all that learning with uh, this group assembled here today. So in our 15 minutes, just to give you a quick overview of where we're going, we're gonna talk a little bit about the challenge that we're finding when it comes to creating meaningful partnerships. Um, how do we know it's a challenge? Some emergent best practices that we've started to identify and then how this can help inform your work. Um, so starting with some of the core challenges of partnership, a lot of these have to do with the structure of nonprofits themselves, and much of that is rooted in the way that funding sources typically do not fund um, data staff. They're seen as overhead. And so a lot of nonprofits lack some of the basic organizational capacity to be able to really plug in. If you bring your expertise to a nonprofit and say, I know how to do all this great programming, you would think that that's a huge win, right? But then sometimes it's hard to make that connection because organizations might lack the person that you're even able to talk, kind of you're talking your expertise with. Um, we also face a lot of resource constraints. Uh, time, money, scheduling, to be able to even introduce the skill set that you have to a nonprofit, it takes a lot of time to sit down to start to unpack some of the questions that we were um, kicking tonight off with, where somebody presents you a spreadsheet and just says, make something. And even as you start to dig into that, well, what are you trying to show? What are you trying to demonstrate? Sometimes it really requires a lot of translation pieces in between. So as uh, the data analyst, one of the big issues you kind of run with is this data alignment problem. So this usually occurs when the CBO or whatever organization you're working with, they have maybe some very ambitious goals. They, they're not maybe particularly tech savvy, so they ask maybe uh, some ambiguous data requests. And so you kind of have this uh, mismatch between what sort of data is available and what sort of data they want. So it's all about trying to uh, close the gap between the two. And the last piece is about building the right work scope. And so sometimes you feel like if you're the helper plugging in, that they should tell you what to do and help you manage the process. But there are ways that you can proactively translate your work and manage the process for success. And there's two components that we're gonna talk about up front, but then we'll come back around. What will we make? So what is the kind of deliverable that we're gonna give and what's the use guidance for it? And then how will we know that we've been successful? And we found that defining quality, what does the partner wanna do with it? Who's gonna be using it? how will we demonstrate good use are all conversations to have up front. 
And I just want to say that part of why we're putting this up here is not because we think that these are things that people don't know, but because we think that sometimes making things that are often implicit or shared or learned from experience explicit and putting them out there for people to build upon and sort of consider um, is really valuable when we want to think about how we do our work with high quality. Um, simply put, high quality partnerships, um, power is shared and it's fair. One of the things that we talk about a lot is sometimes people with um, really uh, difficult tech skills, it's really, it's really valued, right? But sometimes when you're talking about on the ground workers, we hear sometimes this power dynamic where because you're coming in with heavy skills, sometimes we downplay the value of the context of what's actually happening. And so one of the things that we've found is that when we have kind of a misalignment in terms of where people think the power sits in these relationships, you're setting up yourself up for failure. So one of the things that we really want to stress that in strong partnerships, the power is split. There's tech skills, there's content knowledge, and coming together and sitting and being able to have a conversation where the process is just fair and equitable, that's a really the way to build a strong relationship. So uh, we'll be going through a couple case studies that will kind of help illustrate the uh, challenges we've faced and the uh, kind of best practices we've uh, tried to develop uh, throughout our work. So I'll be talking about the first one, which is with our uh, My Brother's Keeper Action Team. So this is a uh, collection of organizations that are working for the benefit of young men of color and are working towards collective impact. So while they're all, they all share this overarching common goal of uh, rising, raising the living standards of young men of color, they all kind of have different constituencies and different goals they're individually trying to raise. So for example, they can vary along geographies and then which specific goals they're trying to kind of working towards. So this includes uh, school administrators, so like principals and, uh, and superintendents that are trying, really concerned about uh, graduation rates. And then you have these mentorship organizations that are trying to match young people with mentors so they can learn uh, soft skills and try to navigate uh, through life. And then you also have these employment organizations that are more focused on matching young people with internships, uh, apprenticeships, and then kind of employment and career driven goals. So uh, with this action team, the kind of the challenge is you, they usually have these kind of ambiguous, ambitious data requests. And you know, these, there's these large organizations that have uh, perhaps shooting in many different directions and then it's trying to then kind of uh, bring these down into something that's more manageable. So uh, with this uh, specific uh, uh, occurrence, we split this group into four different groups and then we talked to them for 10 minutes each and we uh, presented them with this uh, prompt. So disregarding all issues of data availability and feasibility, what type of data do you want and what type of da data would you find useful? So the key part of all this is uh, this is disregarding the data availability and feasibility because those create uh, perhaps unnecessary barriers when thinking about what uh, organizations truly want. So it allowed for a lot of creative flow, a lot of uh, back and forth as we tried to uh, really get at something that would be useful. So again, this was a very iterative process where open up the prompt, they kind of shot some examples at us and then we kind of did this back and forth and then we as the data team talked about it to uh, get towards something. So a couple of different things we kind of found out of these just general discussions is that there is definitely a healthy demand for data insight. People want to use data to uh, inform what they're doing. They want to use data to uh, learn what the impact of their organization is and to uh, guide their program as they move through the future and make uh, different changes to it to make it more efficient and, uh, and better. And so with this came a wide range of responses and suggestions for what type of data they want. You had some that were very feasible, something like getting employment data down to the community level, something that we can use GIS to create a map and present to them, so that's very doable. Something about getting graduation rates at the school level and then mapping that as well and then presenting that to them. So the stuff that's very feasible, but then we got some other stuff that was very ambitious that wasn't uh, necessarily clear what they wanted. So this included something like what, having an indicator for something like purpose in life. So what, so what is it they, they were very interested in how can we tell if somebody has a purpose in life? And so that's a very amorphous topic. And then another example is something like what, how do we measure the impact of racism and systemic factors on outcomes for these young men? So I'll be speaking more about the purpose in life one as we worked it out as a data team. So 
this is a very amorphous topic. It's a very vague uh, thing that has many different parts. So, uh, so you know, we have to figure out how to break this down into something that's practical, and then how can we find publicly available data that can be informative to these people. So something we so the first thing we did was kind of break this very kind of vague concept down into three different components. Something that was if you have a plan for the future, so kind of a, a, some sort of career ambition, uh, some idea of what you want to do post secondary, and then the second component was this more of like connectivity to your community, so being an active member of your community, or being a leader in your community, and then the third component, which is the one we kind of stuck with, was this idea of have, of physical, dietary, spiritual, and mental health. This idea of being having this uh, sense of assurance in yourself, uh, this, having this confidence in yourself. So uh, when we were thinking about this, we knew there is a lot of publicly available data on mental facility locations, hospital locations, and uh, like grocery store locations, you know, on the Chicago Data Portal and uh, otherwise. So then we started thinking, okay, maybe we can create something that's more about access to data. And uh, so something we're planning on doing is then creating a map that has you know, your access to these various locations and then um, mapping it against the location of these young men of color. So David talked a little bit about taking a squishy concept and then creating structure around it and turning it into something that we can start to think about ways to measure. I'm going to move in the opposite direction. I'm going to share a little case study about something where we started and we thought the answer was data. And then we took a step back and realized it's the people, the processes, the relationships that really support data that was the solution. So one of the things that we do is we work with a lot of youth serving organizations. And many of the organizations we work with work closely with schools. But collectively, one of the things that they've told us is that they wanted a way to be able to demonstrate their value to schools. To even get into the school, they need to prove to the principal that it's important that they're there and that they help youth in achieving outcomes that the principal is interested in. But how can they demonstrate that? And what could they better do to enhance what they were calling school engagement is kind of the term that they gave to this challenge. The organizations that we worked with identified three common barriers related to school engagement. First was communicating accurate and realistic data with school partners. The type and level of data that our organizations had varied completely based on the size of the organization, who they had working, what they were collecting. Um, second was the consistency and quality of relationships. It varied so much school to school based on the specific person that was going in from the organization as well as the person that they were meeting with in the school. Sometimes it was a principal, sometimes it was assistant principal, sometimes it was another administrator. And there was so much variability based on that relationship. And then the third was access to resources and space. Um, this was kind of symptomatic of not strong relationships, or at least that's what our partners ultimately identified, that if only they had these strong relationships, then that would open up all of these other potentials that maybe they could get more space in a gym, maybe the, if the school had an extra bus, they could kind of help and really build a relationship from there. So what did we do to begin to break down this, this challenge? Because initially what started was this idea of, well, Thrive, you guys have data. How about you help us just give us a report that we can all go in to share with our school principals, and that's going to solve all of these issues. But what we did is over a series of four months, we held what were called design meetings, where we sat down with organizations on a bi-weekly basis, and we really started to pick apart these challenges. And what are the different components of it? And we put this all into a CQI framework, which is how we ground a lot of the work that we do at Thrive. This idea that continuous quality improvement gives us this space that we can approach problems as if we're going to come up with a whole bunch of different possible um, interventions, but they don't have to be 100% correct to start with. We just know we need to get started and we need to try something and we need to keep testing, retesting, evaluating what works, what doesn't work, and keep improving. And by doing that, we were starting to put one step in front of another and just start to test different things, taking this very like squishy idea of going in and having these conversations with school principals and really started to break down, okay, what do we have control over? And so one of the things that we learned that we had control over is the actual process on how this happens. Every organization in the room said that there was some sort of implicit idea of how you have a conversation, but none of them had an agenda. None of them had training where you bring on new staff and say, these are the things you need to talk about. This is how you do goal setting. These are the first, second, and third things you need to talk about. So instead, what we did is we walked through organization by organization, listened to them tell us their process, and then we started to build out a process map collectively as a group. 
And what this did is it what just as Denali was saying earlier, it took something that was already kind of happening, but not in a consistent way, and started to give it structure, started to give it some bullet points in terms of best practices when they brought the report. But what we learned is that this report that everybody was talking about that was so important lived within this much bigger system that if they were able to kind of use this whole system, that was starting to create some consistency within relationships. So I think these two case studies demonstrate the kinds of challenges that you face when you come to an organization and you say, how can I help you? And they tell you something and you want to say, how can I help you again? Sometimes you have to ask a bunch of, of times. And I don't want to make it seem like we have the answers. We're still learning, which is why these are emerging best practices. Um, but the biggest thing that I feel like I've learned in this work is that to kind of reiterate what Jessica said, sometimes we don't have to take all the data, put it together and get the one answer. Sometimes all we need to do is get people to a decision point. So starting by asking people, what is it that you need to do? We can help people move forward in a really productive, mission-driven way without necessarily breaking down a, co a construct all the way. So here are three things that I feel like kind of exemplify this. One is a famous quote from Justice Potter Stewart about pornography. Sometimes we have to sit in that uncomfortable space of, you know, I know it when I see it. And so how can I put information in front of people so that they can say, I know it when I see it? Maybe their criteria are not formalized at this moment, but if we're building upon someone's human capital and expertise, getting the right information in front of the right person can be the next step in the process. The other thing is, um, some of you may have heard of the Bechdel test. So there's this idea about representation and gender and media. How do we think about these really complex constructs? Well, uh, Alison Bechdel's friend Liz Wallace said, I only go to a movie if it satisfies three basic requirements. It has to have at least two women in it who talk to each other about something other than a man. And so that is something that brings you to an action step of yes or no without diving so deeply into, I have to understand this construct all the way from top to bottom and I have to have all the data before I can move forward. And the last woman here is Virginia Apgar, who came up with the Apgar score, um, which is something, for those of you who don't spend a lot of time around little babies, um, that's administered right after birth and then a couple of minutes later. And it's a five component test that a clinician can give where you score five different things on a score from zero to two. And the total score gives you an action step about kind of does the baby go to the NICU or not. And even though this is kind of a squishy thing that's measured in sort of perception and a zero to two scale that doesn't necessarily correspond with hard and what we think of as precise measurements, it's a founding cornerstone of clinical neonatology and it's saved the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of babies. So what you come up with may not feel full or finished or precise, but if it gets people to the next step in the really important work that they're doing, then it's really useful. It could be the thing that they're looking for. And so when we go back to some of the challenges that we started to talk about at the beginning, we started internally to think about when we face a certain kind of challenge, what should we do? And what does high quality practice space in that look like? And how will we know when we've done it? And sort of to the work that David does, um, developing a work plan with clear expectations and starting to scope and signal products. Are you looking for a map? Are you looking for a framework? Are you looking for an indicator? What can I put in your hands to help you get to the next step is helpful. Um, to Jessica's point, thinking about speaking a common language based on the goals of the work. Every organization she had in the room had different program models and different intents, but they had shared barriers. And so designing a process around those shared barriers meant developing a process and a product that was useful to people. Um, the other thing I will say about useful products, this is something that kind of came up in a conversation, but when you walk away, can the person who you're giving this thing to use it, and can they explain it to their boss's boss? Because that's sort of the thing that helps you know whether something is sustainable and has legs in an organization. And so here are some rough cuts of emergent best practices. When you get started, Circle around needs, values, motivations, and capacity, because these are things that we can all talk about in a shared language that don't privilege your methodological or technological expertise, but help you understand the spirit of the work to guide what you do. And some of these questions that I use sometimes is, what's the thing you want to do now that you can't do? I ask people, what's your ideal condition of well-being? And someone is much more likely to say something like purpose than, I really think somebody who's uh, employed sustainably for six months at a certain above minimum wage threshold, right? Because there are core concepts that are important to us that we don't want to pare down before we get to the work. Um, and I guess thinking to yourself, what's my angle to help? Maybe I'm just here for a little bit of the ride or maybe I'm here all the way through. But wherever I can take you from here to here, that's what matters. Moving forward, iterate, iterate, 
do it again, and then iterate. So we have to kind of carry the work a little bit for other people, but give them clear decision points and set what we call an inclusive table. We have to listen. Um, and I you know, have a training in qualitative methods, so like, listen like a researcher. Start breaking things down, organize. Where can you move? Where can you not move? Get at the need behind the need. Why is this a challenge? Why do we think it's happening? What are the root causes? And focus on your shared methods and process. So when somebody asks, what are the methods by which you derive this thing, don't necessarily just jump into what you did with the data, but start with, we sat down together and we agreed on this shared vision. And finishing strong is making sure that you give someone something that they can use. Um, and think about how to identify ways that the work can continue, because the best thing about a partnership is that it's a partnership. You've now established a relationship and a strong track record to move forward. So this is a graphic that, um, I don't know, I really like this. Thank you, Jessica, for creating it. Um, you got folks who are on this side with deep knowledge of programs and real passion. You've got people on this side sometimes with methods and data. And for one reason, we can't get across. But the way to bridge the gap, create sustainable power dynamics and good communication so that we can get to the products that are fun for us to design and useful for them to use, are about centering on vision, values, practice, and expectations, all of which live in the space of communications and power dynamics. So without being an expert, taking a little bit of reflective time to understand how you walk into a room and what that room is and how everyone else is walking into it can start setting you up for success. And so this is us, and we're happy to take questions. Formerly from healthcare, Joint Commission, you mentioned continuous quality improvement. How do you merge that conversation with evaluation? Because that's what it is. I mean, what you're talking about certainly is evaluation. And so how do you merge, get them to get that point? Because when I worked with nonprofits, after having worked in, in public health and in some corporate health, how did you make, how did you get, and then working for nonprofits, like, where have you been? <laughs> But how did you get that conversation for them to see that it's, you know, you're looking at uh, goals and measurable objectives to help them get to that future point and also to, to figure out what are the actions that they can take that they can, that it's, they can duplicate for the following year. So it's, as you said, continuous quality improvement. Uh, oh, I'll kick it off and then give it to Nali. Um, to start, it's a kind of silly example, but one of the things is just because some of the people in the room might not be familiar with continuous quality improvement, uh, and by people in the room, the people, the organizations that we work with, there's a Mr. Potato Head activity. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this in the space of CQI. Um, essentially, we put up a picture on the screen of a Mr. Potato Head all dressed and ready, break people out into breakout groups around the room, and time everybody in putting together Mr. Potato Head exactly as he looked on that screen. And then we, we do it repeatedly to track what are the different elements of putting them together that they could improve that quickly, that whoever, basically everybody's having a competition around the room to see who gets him most correct and the fastest. And so by kind of jumping into what can be otherwise like more complex topics with organizations, we typically use just like fun um, and entertaining little demonstrations to first introduce the topic. And then we have scaffolded activities that organizations then take home and work on with what we call home teams, um, where they identify different challenges within their own organization so that, that they can go kind of through that process. In terms of connecting that to larger evaluation work, I will hand over to Denali. So um, there's a couple of things, and I think they all come back to reflective practice um, and approaching people from a perspective of evaluation that's not an accountability or compliance one, which you know is a tough thing to do, but sort of in our space, we're about capacity building and technical assistance. Um, and so I tell people that they're often responsible for outcomes and impact, and what you're doing with your resources and all the processes that you have is sort of setting up an optimization challenge. And so there's a generalized program logic model that I use that I say, do we believe that if we do the right things for the right people at the right time, and we do them with fidelity to a good model, and with consistency and quality and expertise, that we will be moving people towards these outcomes? And most people say, sure. And I say, great, fill in these boxes for me. Tell me how they're aligned and then start to optimize so that you understand where you're pouring in resources to move outcomes. And I think once they understand that there are some levers that they can pull, they're much, and that evaluation is about thinking about the individual components of your program and how they fit together, people tend to feel much more open to it because they think, okay, so now this is an optimization challenge about how to get the most out of my program rather than evaluation as in someone's gonna give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. 
And so once they have that reflective practice there, then you can run sort of low stakes continuous quality improvement cycles by saying, okay, so what if we sent your people to this training? What if we do this? What if we do that? And they feel more comfortable experimenting because it's not high stakes. I wonder if uh, there are any challenges around pace of work or the pace of the partnership um, and how you navigate that across different uh, organizations. Yeah, I mean, always. So we do a lot of internal consulting work for our other um, folks who we work with who are focused on different areas of the cradle to career continuum. And because you have to work iteratively, you've got to take all of this information, and it's kind of like drinking from the fire hose, do that kind of um, organization analysis and feasibility sketch out that David talked about, do a little bit of design, give it back to somebody and put it out there. And if the organization is not ready to move on it, you just sit for a while. So a lot of times it's kind of hurry up and wait. So I would say work plan, setting expectations and saying we're kind of trying to get to this fork in the road or these decisions points by this period of time and we think we'll do this many iterations, give people a sense of how to commit their time. But that's probably the biggest challenge of doing this work responsibly. Um, is there a flowchart or project management tool that you recommend? Um, one of the things that we have right now is we have a room with charts everywhere and post-it notes, and we've been writing out different steps of the process and moving them all around the room. Um, we've also experimented with a few different online platforms, but just given the pace of the work, because as Denali mentioned, we're both doing kind of internal consulting and then we have external partner stuff. There's just so much going on all the time, and there are three of us that uh, sometimes just the regular old pen and paper is a really helpful way of keeping track of things. Can you give a brief overview of Thrive and then uh, within that, the context of the data team? I, I, you, you started to talk about the internal consulting for Thrive and external consulting for partnerships. Can you talk a little bit more about how that works? So we've been around. Uh, there are several different origin stories for Thrive. Um, one of which is the need for an organization like what we do grew out of the 2012 teachers union strike. And at the time, um, the mayor's office realized there needed to be a quick way to consult with all of the organizations that provide services to the city to figure out where could we quickly um, deploy resources to make sure that kids have a safe place to stay while schools are closed. And you would think, given how much city funding there is, that there should be like one centralized way to like, contact everybody and have a strong sense of like, where programs are, what buildings, all of that, and there's not. Um, similarly, uh, I've also heard that at one point, Mayor Emanuel asked, how many guitar programs are there in the city? And again, you would think, given all of the city funding, that that's an easy question to answer. And again, it's not. Um, so what the, both those stories kind of highlighted the need to have some sort of organization within the ecosystem of out-of-school time providers and in-school time in-school providers to get a sense of where are the resources across the city and how are we making sure that they're being equi equitably distributed um, and funded and all of those things. So that kind of the idea for our organization kind of spun out of that. Um, so what we do is we do collective impact and we're organized around the cradle to career continuum. So that means that we organize different organizations across the spectrum. And one of the things that we as the data team do, we have something called the Thrive Data Partnership. And essentially what we do with that is we're able to connect, um, say, the YMCA uh, student enrollment data with student uh, performance data at CPS so that organizations get insight at the aggregate level to how their students are performing in schools. And that idea is that to better connect um, all of the caring adults that are in a student's life so that everybody can help support children where they're at so that we see improved academic outcomes. What do your, um, the organizations that you work with, what do they mean by data? You mentioned that many of the organizations don't have um, data analysts in-house. Um, you also mentioned that you are experienced in qualitative, uh, working with qualitative data. Are people usually looking for, um, to, uh, looking for data to quantify things or are they looking to like make, you know, extract meaning out of knowledge that they have in their organization, what do they mean by data? Yeah, so I think of the things that we do, one of the biggest capabilities that we're trying to build out as the data team is starting a citywide conversation in the sort of advocacy and community building space about what data means. And so there's a little bit of a hierarchy that prizes administrative and quantitative data at the top because it's broad-based, it's regularly occurring, it's available, um, but oftentimes it's not specific to the needs of organizations. So what we want to do is help them see a full universe of quantitative data, qualitative data, of administrative data, of program data, 
sort of individual level longitudinal and trajectory data, um, the way that I kind of think about it is data is a language that we speak to talk about um, things at scale. And so whether that scale is many, whether that scale is complexity, and whether that scale is depth, we need some sort of higher order language to just be able to organize all our constructs. And when I put that framing out there, then organizations can say, well, you know, there's a lot of um, knowledge that's happening among my staff about good practice, and we want to collect it so we can define our program model with fidelity. But they may also want to say, how many X's do we do in a Y? Um, and I want to open up the conversation for them to do both. I think most of the time, um, for better or for worse, funding drives a lot of these conversations, and so they're coming to us saying, we have to demonstrate our usefulness, or we have to demonstrate our outcomes. Um, and I'd like that conversation to shift to a broader conversation about how do we do the things that we do. Can, can you clarify that last point just around um, how, how do the difference between how do we um, demonstrate our outcomes and then uh, how do we do the things that we do? Yeah. yeah, sure. So again, right, with the generalized theory of change model, there are a lot of things that go into outcomes. Some of them are resources, some of them are training, some of them are about the quality, some of them are about the program model, and some of them are about the, the alignment of all of those things. And I think if we just focused on outcomes, right, how do we get kids who graduate from high school in our program? Here's a great idea. Get rid of all the kids in your program and replace them with kids who are doing great in school. Right? But that's not the question. That's not the real question everyone's trying to solve. And so I think it's, what is it that you're trying to do and how can you do it your best? And then how can you align so that everybody is doing their best work? Again, to drive towards that vision that Jessica articulated, which is that every young person in the city of Chicago should have a network of caring adults behind them who are aligned working with quality, consistency, and expertise to make sure that they are being served according to their needs, their interests, and their goals. Right? Like I think that's just a powerful vision that we can all get behind. Um, maybe, I hope so. Um, and there's just a lot of work that needs to happen all over the place to make sure that those adults can come together in that aligned way to support every young person. Awesome.